Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Hoff on the Mullane Haw Show on 670 The Score. Dan Weeders from the Chicago Tribune covering the Bears. It is the unofficial start of summer. It is relatively slow on the LNFL calendar, but it sleeps for no one. Bears back on the practice field for OTAs this week, Dan. And we do have plenty of stuff to consider. First of all, what is the Bears schedule this week post Memorial Day? Yeah, we are back in the OTA portion of the offseason program. Another three days of organized team activity practices in Lake Forest. Wednesday uh, will be the day this week that is open to the media, the chance where we'll get a chance to see Justin Fields throw routes on air to DJ Moore and the rest of the world get all in a lather about the video clips that come off of that. And then next week, we'll have another week of three straight organized team activities. Two weeks from now, we'll get the mandatory team mini camp, which we'll be able to be at every single day to watch Justin Fields throw passes to Chase Claypool, in which everyone will get all in a lather about, and we can discuss all of it. And maybe even Darnell Mooney? Is that in the cards? Is that in the plan? Do you think he can be back on the field for mini camp? I, I highly doubt he'll be back on the field in any sort of uh, team-based drills. We'll see where he can progress to. I think they are, are very optimistic about his ability to be ready for training camp and want to prioritize him being available and ready for training camp. Darnell obviously recently shared that he had had uh, tightrope surgery to repair uh, a fractured fibula down near the ankle. He's got screws now in that left ankle, and now it's going to be a matter of us using our eyes to see how uh, he looks with, with the metal uh, in, in his body. I know you were very worried around draft time about people Definitely. that were going to get uh, 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 metal detectors going off at the airport because of surgeries they've had. Well, you can add Darnell Mooney to your uh, to your watch list. Oh, don't think I haven't already added him there. I'm already <laughs> concerned in advance. I'm a preemptive warrior. So we will talk about many things. We're going to talk about Chris Sims' quarterback ranking list. We're going to talk about the Twitter spat that you engaged in over the weekend. Uh, David Montgomery had plenty to say about joining the Lions. DeAndre Hopkins has a new home. Jimmy G is uncertainty about his uh, next move with the Las Vegas Raiders. Demolition will begin this week at Arlington Heights at the old race course, and that's really something to keep an eye on, Dan. But look, this is this type time of year where there's a lot of NFL debate, some of it, most of it manufactured and, and maybe not all that relevant, but it is interesting. And it does force us to kind of take stock of what we're watching and what we're seeing. And Chris Sims is the, the latest uh, from NBC Sports, and he's got a great debate show on a daily basis with Mike Florio. They, those guys are very compelling in terms of addressing things that uh, they know how to light a spark. And Chris Sims's quarterback rankings from 40 to 20 certainly did that. Justin Fields comes in at number 23. Now, it depends on how you look at it, whether you feel like he was unfairly uh, ranked too low, or maybe that's about right, or maybe some people, I doubt it, but feel like it's too high. Where do you come down on what Chris Sims thought in terms of where Justin Fields ranks among NFL quarterbacks? Well, first and foremost, for our audience, he was sandwiched in between a group at 25 and 24 that included Kenny Pickett and Baker Mayfield. 22 and 21 were Jimmy Garoppolo, Tua Tungavailoa, and number 20 was Mac Jones. So it tells you kind of the tier he's on. Mike Sando every year at The Athletic goes through and asks executives and people uh, that are talent evaluators in the league to help him put together his quarterback tiers. That usually comes out later in the summer around training camp. I would imagine that Justin Fields will be in a similar tier when those rankings come out later. This is how the league views Justin Fields in his current state. Justin Fields is going into a prove-it year without question here, where his uh, ability to climb that ladder is going to be open for him. And he's going to be able to, to, to prove to the world that he's better than, than some people say. But for right now, this is kind of how he's viewed. And David, what was most notable to me was in listening to the entirety of Chris Sims's discussion about Justin Fields, he told no lies. I know there are a lot of Bears fans and people in Chicago that got uh, really riled up by some of the criticisms that, that Chris Sims um, put forth on who Justin Fields is a quarterback. There was some contention that he didn't uh, put enough spotlight on the supporting cast that Justin had to play with in 2022, which has obviously been very well documented on this podcast. Uh, but I do think that he was very, very honest and very, very consistent with what we have heard from people that we have talked to both late last season and throughout the offseason about what Justin's thumbnail scouting report is in the NFL. And so I have no problems with where he is in the ranking or the logic he used in getting there. And I know uh, you've got some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think that before we hear from Chris Sims himself, I, I was most surprised looking at the list of, say, 25 through 20. 
where Tua was. I, I thought that was a little low for a quarterback who obviously with the concussions, those are going to downgrade him. But if there was a, a, a quarterback between 20 and 25 that I thought maybe didn't belong there, it, it was Tua Tonga Bailoa because of what he's capable of doing. And I think that he might be ahead. Now, if you want to have the conversation about, well, who would you rather have, Tua or Justin Fields? I think it's a little different in terms of potential. But based on production, if this is what this list incorporates, I was a little surprised there. 23 for Justin Fields. I would probably have him a little higher. But let's hear from Chris Sims in terms of why he put Justin Fields right now where he did. God, we got that. Insane runner. Like, insane. Like, where you go, it's insane enough to... When you put him up there with some of the better receivers and running backs in football, you go, it's as dangerous as some of those guys in the open field. But his throwing is a collection of great plays with no consistency. In fact, his overall quarterback game is that. And that's where he's 23 for me, right? Yeah, I, you know, I know. Hey, look at, you look at some of the games where he had good stats and good runs, and you go, ooh, ooh but, but they lost. And he still made a number of you know, mistakes or bad throws in those games to where I just, I can't buy into it yet. I got to see a little bit more before I can start to say, oh, he's ready to take over the world here or, or do something special, right? Uh, I think, you know, where are the bad throws coming from? Why are they happening? His motion is still funky and he has no confidence in his throwing, right? He turns down more what I would call NFL open throws than anybody I watched in the top 40, where you go, now he's open. You know, it's tight, but that's NFL open, and he doesn't want to throw it because he doesn't trust where it's going to go. And that, I know. I've been there. I've been there before, too, where you lose confidence, your mechanics are a little off, and go, wait, I don't control it, and you start to turn down plays. That's Chris Sims. Interesting stuff. No lies told. Like I say, no lies told. This is a quarterback who had an 85.2 passer rating for the league's worst passing attack in 2022. He obviously does a lot of special things as a runner, which Chris Sims noted and said that he's as dynamic in the open field as a lot of running backs and wide receivers in the game, which is high praise for who Justin is as a runner. Now it's all about finding that consistency as a passer. I thought him saying that it's a collection of great plays with no consistency is exactly uh, a, a succinct phraseology of what a lot of people in the league have been saying. There's a lot of made for Twitter highlight clips mixed together with a lot of, uh Oh, why aren't you throwing that ball? Why aren't you staying in the pocket longer? Why aren't you making reads quicker? All of those things are there. All of those things have been set up at Hellas hall as boxes. Justin needs to check in 2023. And now again, we'll have to wait three and a half months until we get live regular season game action to see how much progress he's made to see if it's light years ahead of where he finished last year to see if it's more than just a collection of great plays. Justin owns his story now. He has the pen. He can write whatever story he wants for 2023, and we'll be here to relay it to the masses. That's a good way to put it. I think the things that stand out to me are, are about the, the great plays, as you point out, with no consistency. That's what's eluded Justin Fields as an NFL quarterback. Also, the mechanics, if you want to call his throwing motion funky or unorthodox or you know, lacking fluidity, however you want to describe it, I think that Chris Sims is onto something. And Again, this is very difficult sometimes to talk about these things objectively because the way Chris Sims is talking about Justin Fields, to me, the way I'm interpreting what I hear is that this is the way a coach would evaluate Justin Fields if Justin Fields went to him for a quarterback clinic or a weekend or, or frankly, if Chris Sims were Justin Fields' quarterback coach with the Bears, these are the things that he would introduce on day one of season three and say – you know what, our ceiling is as high as any young quarterback in the NFL. But where we are right now, we've got a lot of work to do to get there. This is what we need to work on. That's not an insult, and this isn't criticism of Justin Fields. This is objectively evaluating where this immense talent, this special player is right now and where he can go if he can change some of these things and improve upon them. Peanut Tillman was the guest speaker at the start of rookie minicamp earlier this month. And one of the messages that a lot of players and coaches took away from Peanut Tillman was the concept of run towards criticism. Understand where your flaws are. Understand how, how coaches and people that you trust see your game and then work to improve that. 
this applies directly to the starting quarterback of the Chicago Bears right now, and I don't think Justin runs away from it. Never has. That, that's what I was going to ask you because you're up there a lot more than I am, and, and I think that based on what we hear, based on the answer to the question last week about the contract, I care about wins, not about contracts, the way he is wired, it seems like he can accept some of these objective analyses of his game better than the people around him perhaps or bears fans or media who are very defensive when it comes to objectivity <laughs> surrounding Justin Fields. And I'm not saying that to be snide or anything else, but I, but I think that the player is better equipped to handle run toward criticism is a great way to put it. And Pina Tillman knows that because that's sort of an old school approach, but I think Justin Fields is an old soul in a young quarterback's body. So this makes a lot of sense. And I think it's encouraging for bears fans that he is like that. So he's not going to overreact to slights like this. And he's going to take just enough, just enough. He's got just enough Jimmy Butler in him, if you will, to right. take everything as a perceived slight and use that to his advantage. Well, and it doesn't have to be an edgy motivation. It has to be a internal self-drive motivation, which Justin has. One of the things I'll say it for the thousandth time, if I'm creating a quarterback from scratch, I will get several strands of Justin Fields' DNA and I will replicate them, right? Because the guy is tough tough as nails. He's mentally strong. He's capable of leading. He's capable of riding the roller coaster that comes with an NFL season. He has a mentality to bring others around him for along for the ride to point the thumb instead of the finger. All of the things that you want in that pinpoint leader of your offense and of your football organization, Justin Fields embodies. Now he has to become consistent as a passer. This isn't that hard to understand. And I think most of the league now has its arms around it. I think it was difficult within the season last year to kind of surf through the euphoria and all the things that came with all the rushing exploits and the highlight reel plays and get a true understanding of where the quarterback growth process was. I think as we've scaled back, more and more people have been able to watch more of Justin to deliver their feedback on what they're seeing, Chris Sims being the latest. And it's a very consistent thumbnail. That, that, that That's the whole thing here, David, is, is this is not some shock jock come up with an extreme take so people will listen to my podcast take. Chris Sims said what a lot of people have said in different forms. Forms. And it's a very consistent scouting report on Justin. Justin is the only one that can change that. And now it's the Bears task to bring the best out of him as they go forward. And to their credit, they have now done a lot of things with personnel upgrades and, and now, you know, unifying him with the coaches, whether it be Luke Getze or Andrew Janoko or Matt Eberflus, that are going to help him try to clear these hurdles that need to be cleared in 2023. Last thing for me on this before we move on, I would just say that all that we said about the the description or the analysis or the evaluation of where he is is valid. If you're a Bears fan and you do want to get triggered by something in this <laughs> list, before we hear from next week, the 20 through uh, number one, I think that's when Chris Sims in a couple of days is going to release the rest of this list. I don't think that if you look at 22, 21, and 20, 22 is Jimmy Garoppolo. Too injured too often for him to be ahead of Justin Fields in my book. Sure. 21 is too uh, – that's too low for him because I do think that he is uh, on the verge, if he can stay healthy, of breaking through yet again. And I think he did that to some degree in 2022. Matt Jones at 20 makes no sense to me because I think he took a huge step backward. As much of a step forward as Justin Fields took in his second season, I think J Matt Jones may have taken a step backward if we're talking about the draft class, quarterback draft class of 2021. So if you want to quibble about anything, I think it would be those two guys in front of Justin Fields, not necessarily what was said about his game. Those are fair points, and I need to listen deeper to what the evaluation of Mac Jones was. I think there's some wiggle room given for the uh, situation he had around him last year with with the, the strangeness of Matt Patricia and Joe Judge being the guys kind of kind of ushering him through the process, and we'll see where he goes and what's going to be, again, a, for as much as at stake for Justin here, there's a lot at stake for Mac Jones as well. I always prefer the tier system when we're doing these rankings, even during draft time. You know, it's really easy to get caught up in like, okay, this is guy number 37 and guy 39. Well, if you zoom out and you see that they're all really kind of on the same level and they're just bunched together or however you want, the tier system makes a lot more sense in my brain. That's why I look yeah. forward to Mike Sandoz piece in the athletic every year, because it, it very successfully, usually you say, okay, this is the tier and it makes sense to me. The brain computes that way. Um, one more point from me, and maybe it's a natural segue. If you want to be triggered about things, just come to my Twitter account because apparently that has a way of sending people off as well. Well, I was going to say, if you want to get uh, <laughs> talk about getting going down a rabbit hole in a Twitter machine, um, you would know nothing about that except for what you encountered over the weekend in doing 
just that. Um, I will just say that the t- one tweet that I put out on the Chicago Bears offense garnered a lot more reaction than uh, the, you know, talk about my son pitching a really nice game and a win over Oz Park on Saturday. Great game. That's you know what? That's fine. We'll get to that in a little bit. We'll get to that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I want to talk about the double-double with the soccer game and the pitching performance, but let's, t- let's spend a little time on your Twitter excursion I, I, I'm gonna, because I was on vacation, but it did catch my attention in scrolling through. I'm going to read you the tweet. Okay. And maybe maybe studs can chime in as well, because I want you to react just naturally to the tweet that I put out. And you can understand the insane reaction that came back to this. But the tweet said moratorium. Stop saying the Bears offense averaged 30 points per game for a big chunk of last season. They averaged 31.0 for a four game, 21 day stretch in six games before that 15.5 points per game in seven. After that, 15.6. They were bottom 10 in scoring 19.2 points per game, 20.2 in Justin's starts. Wow, did that set up a firestorm? Okay, well, we can bring studs into the equation. Here's the one thing that I objectively would suggest. What you said and how you read it right there was a very reasonable uh, Is it a tone problem again with me, which is uh, often a case not, with me? Not so much a tone problem, Dan. But what, here's the thing. And I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not far be it for me to give you Twitter advice. <laughs> but when one uses all caps, it suggests that you were screaming. Moratorium! <laughs> yes. So all I'm saying is that, you know, so, subtlety is, 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 there's strength in subtlety. Understood. And, and when, you, when you use all caps, you're not going for subtle. You're going like, listen to me because I am right and you are wrong, <laughs> Bears fans. Okay, just this a is, little bit. Even what? though what you what you reported there is factual, is defensible, and is reasonable. But the way that you presented it, I would have probably, if I were copy editing your tweets, I would have said, <laughs> maybe not the screaming all caps moratorium. <laughs> Before I take the stand, I'll get studs as take and then I'll defend myself a little bit. I, I'll just say, like, I, I mean, look, yeah, you, you presented – some 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 facts that's what it was but i think that what what maybe what what people took issue with was it it wasn't a large chunk or what it not or or was it not when it's semantics we're talking about 25 percent of the season the average 30 points a game so that's a quarter of the season ish and so i wouldn't qualify that as a large chunk but i would say a chunk of the season they had a pretty good offense that's 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 my only takeaway i didn't have any issue with it i was like oh yeah that's he's right like, like, yeah, we like you have to keep in mind that after that that stretch, the offense regressed. Now you can talk about like why that was, you know, injuries. Justin was dealing with with some with some you know banged up everything. He was running a thousand miles a week. So yeah, like, yeah, there's like, but it's really just semantics. I think was what what set people off. I yeah, yeah it, was, it was very <laughs> Bears Twitter. And you got to understand too, Bears fans are in a place where they only want to feel good. So that's so, every Twitter. That's every you know, team's Twitter following. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Only one of, well, especially following. It's, especially, you know, coming off a season where we just forgave a team for losing 10 games in a row and having the number one pick in the draft and, and a lot of people just embraced it. And now every, the arrow seems to be pointing up in a lot of ways. So when you come out and you present and you try to temper expectations, which is what you've been doing for a while, <laughs> Like it, it sets people off it, it, instead of just scrolling Pepper past expectation. it. Yeah. <laughs> instead of just scrolling past it, they decide they're going to, they, they have to respond. So I don't, yeah. I don't temper expectations. I create a reality zone and the reality there zone has a, has a fence that I like to keep people inside of, because when you get outside of the reality fence, people start doing crazy things and they're doing uh, See, keg, keg stands on the roof I- and they're, they're doing <laughs> cannonballs, triple Lindy's into kitty pools below. And it's dangerous. And that, that that's all I'm trying to do. And I okay. probably should See, stop doing it. There, no, no, no. Don't stop doing it. But just again, <laughs> it, it's a little bit in the wording. You say reality zone. I say middle ground. It sounds okay. less threatening. When okay. You say, middle ground because what we're talking about is essentially the same thing but it's all in the presentation <laughs> so if you're trying to light a fire and and strike a match blow go at it <sighs> blow torch fine but if you're trying to make a point without necessarily uh you know making a big ruckus but i think that sometimes you don't mind the ruckus and that's okay too because that's I- what twitter is for I have a quick stat correction for studs. It was not 25% of the season. It was 23.5% of the season oh, because the season has expanded to 17 games. <laughs> so, 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 so more than three quarters of the season, they had 
an offense that was half as good points per game wise, right? Averaging less than 16 points per game in the first six okay. games of the year and the final seven. And yet people focus on a four game, 21 day sample size as, as being the uh, compass that tells them the direction to go on their GPS. And you go, well, wait a second. Why are you ignoring the sample size that is three times as big as the one that you chose? I don't, that's the part that I don't get. And people continue to do it. And I got to stop pushing back on it. Or in David's case, uh, to take your advice, I can push back. Let's just do it in a in a in a stone a little, down. A little bit of a nudge. Down. A little bit more of a nudge than a shove. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Because nudges can be effective. It just is if you're if you're persistent with the nudge. Here's the one thing, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole entirely. <laughs> but I did I did wonder this: How in the world did you get from using real logical math in terms of Justin Fields' season to defending? the decision to cut Chuck Leno. I didn't get there. Uh, Bill Zimmerman, I don't even know who he works for anymore, but I know he's one of the oh, yeah, uh, I know leaders okay. of, of the group, I'll say. The group. Uh, see, I, I already toned <laughs> toned down what I was going to say in my head. Thank you. And I appreciate it. And, and he said that he pulled up a tweet of mine from whenever Charles Leno got cut. I don't remember what year that was. And I said that the Bears would be uh, saving a big chunk of calorie, salary cap space by cutting Charles Leno and getting $9 million dollars back on their cap space he went and equated that nine million dollars off the total cap and said that was only five percent and that didn't qualify as a big chunk but somehow 25 percent of the games doesn't uh, qualify. you know all this and i said look the bears at that time when they cut charles leno had five hundred thousand dollars worth of salary cap space they got an eighteen hundred percent increase in salary cap space by cutting charles leno therefore it qualified as a big chunk it was a stupid thing that he obviously went out and searched on twitter at dan weederer comma big chunk and pulled that up to try to, to, to try to, okay. to try to pin so me in a corner on something that, that was really stupid. And so there is a point where I get your point and I'm going to tone it down, but I also am going to be allowed to defend myself uh, when some of these people come at me so full fledged that it I makes absolutely that. no sense. I, I, I know, know I'm, I know I'm Voldemort in some of the world. That's, that's what I was talking about when I said like some people were out there arguing semantics. I didn't know if you were going to bring up that specific tweet. Cause I also saw that. And I was like, well, this is just semantics. It's like just who cares at that point, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> Correct. Like, yeah, like we're arguing over the definition of big chunk, which is just the ultimate <laughs> Twitter argument. Well, I can... ultimate Twitter is a great way to describe all of this. It's why it, the day that I get out of this business is the day I delete Twitter from my phone and never turn <laughs> back. I'll say good, good, good seeing you all and have fun down well, the road. One thing you have to count on when you're playing the Twitter game and this is why I'm trying to g give you some sort of like, you know, reasonable <laughs> advice here. You can never account for the non sequitur gotcha. OK, no, so yeah. people they're coming. Will, will try to play the non sequitur gotcha game because pull something that you tweeted at some point that related to what you're tweeting now and find the inconsistency or the illogical connection. But it just is one of those things that comes with the territory. My last sentiment on this, I have enough self-awareness to understand that Twitter does me no favors. I do Twitter no favors. <laughs> I, I am not built for Twitter. I, I think that people that listen to me, that watch our videos, that, that see me in different forums, I, I, like understand what I'm saying. Twitter doesn't do it well because I struggle with tone on there. Caps lock gets into my way every once in a while. <laughs> Exclamation points get out there. A little bit of condescension creeps into the way I phrase things. And, and I, can't, I can't wriggle free of it. But uh, yeah, the m much more likable version of me is here talking to you right now. Self-awareness is a good thing. And I'm, I'm not criticizing as much as I'm trying to help you out. Because <laughs> I felt for you when I was um, on vacation and was going down a rabbit hole and I couldn't stop you. Okay, moving on. So speaking of, of maybe things that came out the wrong way, <laughs> David Montgomery was watching a video game with uh, Chauncey Gardner right? With the Detroit Lions. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, yep. Yeah, Tra Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, the new Lions defensive back with the new Lions running back. And they were doing something on the Twitch stream, I think playing NBA 2K, I, I guess. Just um, talking to each other. This is the world now, right? Play yeah, video games yeah. and talk, and we're going to live stream it to millions of people. I, be, I found it very distracting, Dad. <laughs> I found it very distracting because they're doing something else. But anyway, David Montgomery basically said it was nice to be appreciated by a team. Look, I, I think you may have been taken out of contact. I don't know. I all I can say is this. The Bears appreciated David Montgomery. There's no doubt in my mind. And they even would have liked to have had him back. 
didn't he turn down the same similar kind of kind very of comparable very comparable from multiple guarantees? sources yeah. from multiple sources that the bears thought that they had presented an offer that was at least as good as the one the lions presented so that that's that's one thing to debunk there the idea that if the bears had been the highest bidder david montgomery would still be here and he wouldn't be complaining he clearly wanted a fresh start um and he's vocalizing some of the reasons why he wanted a fresh start it's okay to push back on what he said it's okay to say uh that the bears made the right decision um, but, you know, David, here, I'm going to read you the, the full quote that caught my ear, because there's one thing in here that, that was interesting to me. He said, that's all I was used to. And it got to a point where it sucked the fun out of the game for me because I'm a competitor. I like to compete. That's what football is all about. It's so refreshing to be in a place where that's appreciated. And, and the, the thing that catches my ear there is it sucked the fun out of the game for me. And what he's talking about there is the losing and the losing and the losing. And the losing, you got to understand that David Montgomery's first game in a Bears uniform is the kickoff game of the 100th uh, season of the NFL. And there's sky high Super Bowl expectations going into that year. And there's an electric environment at Soldier Field. And they lay an egg in that opener against the Packers. And they've really just been a mediocre to way below average team in every single season he's been in the league. And you can understand why a 14 loss year where everything spirals down the drain sucks the fun out of the game for a player like David Montgomery, who's so highly motivated and so competitively driven that losing 10 games in a row over a two and a half month span really, really becomes frustrating. Now, look, like Detroit isn't the place where you usually say, yeah, I want to go to a place that's a perennial winner. You know, uh, they weren't very good when David Montgomery entered the league and now they're on a, a an upswing and he's going to have to prove that what he said actually has merit in Detroit. I think a lot of the league thinks that Detroit is a team on the, on the rise, but they got to prove it still after what they did last year. But that, that I, I'm just curious what you take out of that whole suck the fun out of the game for me uh, note, because it, that was the part that caught, caught my ear because to me, it's, it's kind of the residual effect of all that losing, losing by design, or what you've called it something else, failure by strategy. Disaster by design. Yeah. Yeah. You know, th that, that comes with ripple effects. And this is one of them. This is one of them. And this is what, you know, players, professional athletes always have to find, you know, ed the edge, the, the motivation, however, however they can. And I think what David Montgomery sounds like is doing is he is looking at his time in Chicago, especially his last season as the time that, just he hit rock bottom emotionally, and this is time to start on the on the trek back to wherever he's headed as a, as a professional. And he can look at that, and, and there are reasons why, and he can blame whoever he wants to blame. But I, I don't know that it does anything uh, more than you know motivate him. I don't think it puts a bigger target on his back for the Bears when they play him. I don't think it makes him harder to tackle. I don't think it makes much of a difference at all. It's it's probably something that I would, you know, it, again, it's easy to say I'd have the presence of mind not to make this a public thing because the Bears drafted me and they were very good to me while I was in Chicago. That's probably the way I would want him to approach it. But you have to understand that this that's not always the case. And, and we don't know what the nature of negotiations were. We all have sources that say David Montgomery was offered a very fair, similar, comparable contract to stay in Chicago and chose to go to Detroit. Maybe he had had enough and maybe he saw the writing on the wall, but however he needs to motivate himself, I think this falls under that category of self-motivation. Yeah. And, and, and the conclusion is that the bears have a homegrown leader that chose to be somewhere else. And you say, okay, just take note of that inside the building. Like how do we keep these guys wanting to be part of our program going forward? Success is obviously a huge part of that. I also understand the pushback. I heard from people in the building that said, listen, like David was part of their leadership group. If he wanted to change the, the mentality and the approach to things, he had a voice in that locker room. He had control to, to create a tone in there. And that, that David is well known inside the building at Hallis Hall as being not only a fiery competitor, but occasionally very moody, you know, and, and moodiness creates some emotions that, 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 that maybe lead to frustration. I wish him well in his next stop. I think he'll do well there. I think the lions are willing to welcome him there. I think the bears wish him well, there doesn't need to be any sort of bad blood, but I do think it is notable that, you know, that, that, that this is at least some sh uh, shred of evidence that, that the disaster by design comes with some things that, that you probably didn't intend. Yeah, un unintended consequences. I'm sure that falls under that category. Last thing on this is that when you talk about creating that culture that we always reference when you're talking about Brian Poles and Matt Eberflus, they pride themselves in being the same guys every day. 
they pride their structure and the practices and their game weeks as being the same thing every time. To really build a, a culture that you're proud of and that is consistent with what you espouse, you've got to have players who are the same guys every day. Now, as much as respect as we have for David Montgomery and all the things that you heard while he was here, which remain true, he's a, you know a tough guy and all those things. What you said about his moodiness, what he said about maybe being up and down, understandable given the circumstances of all the losing, but you wonder if he was a guy that they felt like was ideally equipped to handle everything that came with the rebuild. And maybe not. Look, it doesn't take – you look at what David Montgomery is saying on the way out and you look at what they're saying about Roshan Johnson on the way in. And that's, that's their, their, their trains are passing in the night, yep. but it's not accidental there. Well, that was the other thing I was going to say to punctuate things is that this, this position in this league is the cruelest position there is because it's such a, give us, give us your all and we're going to kick you to the side as soon as your gas tank goes below a quarter of a tank. And so that creates a level of, pressure and expectation and emotion on running backs in this league, that's hard to deal with, particularly when you're on a team that's losing and losing and losing and losing and losing and losing. Um, and so, look, that's all part of it. And and we'll see what David does in a, in a very interesting backfield situation in Detroit. Now uh, we'll see how they kind of balance him and Jameer Gibbs and, and, and how his role uh, shapes up there in, in what is obviously a very, very pivotal year uh, in that organization, which they are, they are the team, David, that everyone thinks is going to take the North in 2023 and David will have a say in that. And if he, if he achieves that, I'm sure he'll be a lot happier and the fun will be sucked right back into his life. <laughs> It'll be infused. Okay. <laughs> last couple of things before we get out of here. Um, Deandre Hopkins was released by the Cardinals. That's a big number. They have uh, made themselves. I think the tanking capital of uh, America, uh, pro sports <laughs> America with Chicago for the last year. I think that uh, Glendale, Arizona is now, making its bid because the Cardinals have to be tanking. If they're making these kind of decisions, they're going to be really bad. And DeAndre Hopkins won't be there. Where does he land in? I think the Patriots make a lot of sense. I don't think the bears are even need to make a phone call because of the, the, the price and what they already have at the position. But um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, I think Buffalo and Kansas City are among the odds-on favorites. The Bears, I think, were 14th in the points bet odds to land DeAndre Hopkins. Oh, I mean, Patriots. This, this is yeah. I mean, that, that's uh, on radar as well. I mean, he's in his 30s. You know, this is not. We've talked going into free agency that the Bears were not in uh, splurge and surge mode at this time, and so they're not going to go break the bank for a 2023 edition, particularly after they traded for DJ Moore, particularly after they traded for Chase Claypool, particularly after they're trying to get a full evaluation of Darnell Mooney in a contract here. Their receiving core is pretty much solidified and, and they're they're ready to get to the starting gate with that group as they try to address other areas. It's on, you know, DeAndre Hopkins also has a choice and, and the idea of him um, having suitors that are in position to win this year is pretty realistic. You know, and so you're going to you're going to try to create multiple bidders and you're going to find one that gives you a really good deal and you're going to find one that's positioned to allow you to play deep into January potentially. And so um, the Bears don't really figure into this equation. It's always a, a nice thing to do when a big name guy becomes available is assess what his uh, his fit is here. But I don't think anyone in the league thinks that there's much of a of a chance of a union there. I don't think he lands in Vegas either, but it's certainly interesting with the Raiders unrelated to the Bears, but a local guy, Jimmy Garoppolo. Looks like he could be having some issues with his foot. It looks like he could be having some issues with getting on the field. And could he be having some issues with the contract yeah. that includes now, according to Pro Football Talk and Mike Florio, a waiver that if he doesn't pass a physical, they can get out of that deal. That's a very big story around the league this week. Interesting contract structure reading about that in that essentially, it's my understanding he's got to play a game before his deal becomes guaranteed, you know, and so they've got this out that doesn't typically exist in these contracts. And, and, and along with that, there's a, an acknowledgement that the, he failed his physical when they signed him. And it was essentially, man, this foot, whatever bone is broken there in his left foot um, has a chance to get worse as he continues to play football. And, and if he can't get himself in a healthy place there, there's an easy exit for the Raiders, but man, I, I'm guessing they don't want to take that exit because then where does that leave them? 
uh, after making an addition and trying to figure out what, what Jimmy Garoppolo could do to, to revitalize their hopes. It leaves them with Josh McDaniels calling plays for Tom Brady again, <laughs> potentially. But part owner Tom Brady would have to get a whole bunch of people to sign off on him, you know, coming back to play. And it, the, the, the confusion and the drama of it all is, is, is too much. Um, but certainly worth keeping an eye on. And it was a, certainly a unique nugget there that, that Mike Florio dug up. All right, last thing about the Bears in terms of the news this week. Uh, on Tuesday morning, outside Arlington Park in Arlington Heights, just uh, you know where that is. I do. Demolition equipment and crews were stationed outside the shuttered racetrack <laughs> early in the morning, set to begin the first phase of tearing down the historic venue. That, according to the Arlington Heights, Daily Herald. It's coming, Dan. It's uh, history going down. And for a lot of people, it will mark a very sad day, a lot of bittersweet emotions. For others, they'll look at progress and think, oh, wow, in five years from now, could this be the site of the Bears' George S. Hallis Bear Dome? It's both for me. There's no question it's both for me. And honestly, David, when I'm at – uh, barbecues nowadays. The, the two questions you get about the Bears are about wh wh what is Justin Fields going to do in 2023 and when is the stadium going to open in Arlington Heights? Those are the two things people want to talk about. And there's a level of intrigue and excitement about the potential palace and accompanying entertainment district that could go on that property that you just described that has people really, really excited about what the Bears in the suburbs could look like. For me, I spent a lot of days in my childhood with my family going out to the racetrack and, and having great times betting the ponies at Arlington racetrack. And so to see those grandstands come down to drive past that property and realize that that's just a, a nostalgic, you know, sepia toned memory at this point, it's a, there, there's a nostalgic part that hurts, but I'm telling you that, that when you think about the possibility of what can be on those grounds, as you said, five years from now, it's incredibly exciting for where this franchise can head. There's a lot of steps along the way and a lot of uh, hurdles that the Bears are going to have to get around. But man, it's everything to this point, you know, from two years ago until now is progressing the way that we kind of anticipated it would. And it's pushing towards the, the Bears being the Arlington Heights Bears and us eventually getting a whole bunch of renderings that we're going to be talking about in this program going, holy cow, did you see this? Did you see that? Did you see this special feature? Did you see the Bears Hall of Fame and Museum? Did you, I mean, like the, the potential on that land, David, is so grand that it's hard not to be excited, even as you feel a little bit sad for all those memories that are going right into the uh, horse poop beneath the track there. I thought that all people talked to you about at barbecues was your son's future in baseball or soccer. <laughs> Big weekend on that front, too. We had uh, both travel teams had had uh, multiple games. Sunday was a uh, two-game baseball tournament out in Bar uh, Buffalo Grove, followed by a AYSO extra playoff quarterfinal. Uh, they, they, they were one and one in the baseball games, Okay, won the soccer game, five and one came back from one. Oh, at halftime and put on a five goal blitz in about a four minute span. That was awesome. Uh, but the pitching performance, David, in the first game on Saturday morning, walked the first hitter. I was tremendously disappointed in them. Retired the next 12, had a no hitter going wow. into the fifth inning. And at this age, it's hard to get into the fifth inning because you throw too many pitches. But he got out of five innings with 61 pitches the other day in a win. Uh, and it was really fun to watch. That's another Stroman like another nugget for our audience. Uh, friend of the podcast, Mark Potash, uh, was at the game on 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 uh, Sunday morning, came out to the game to watch. And just in pure Potsy uh, fashion, you feel this surge of like, that's a really nice thing to do to come out and watch this baseball game. He wore his Hogan Johns t-shirt to the game. <laughs> Potsy being Potsy at all times, David. Potsy being Potsy at all times. <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. That's <laughs> nice of him to come out, though, especially for that. So all those games, does that qualify as a big chunk of activity? It's a big over chunk. Over the weekend? Listen to this. All right, so we've got... This coming weekend, we've got House Baseball Thursday, Travel Baseball Friday, House Baseball Saturday, uh, Travel Soccer 9 a.m. Sunday, Travel Baseball 1 p.m. Sunday, Travel Soccer Championship game if they survive at 5 p.m. Sunday. So that is a big chunk of sports That's a big activity. Chunk. Coming I don't up think anybody can come too. at you calling that a big chunk. <laughs> That's a significant chunk of, chunk of activity there. And I think Ryan will be back on the mound Friday night. And so we'll see. You know, we always talk in the Weederer household. This was my dad's phrase consistency is the mark of a champion. So we're going to talk about that this week. And that was in all caps. <laughs> you got emails. You got emails from my dad that were in all yes, caps. I know they're that. all caps. Usually I about do. Lovey Smith. Usually about Lovey. Yes, I do remember those fondly. That's great. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we will not be podcasting on Friday night. We'll probably get something done before that because the Bears are back on the field on Wednesday. Access, I believe, goes Wednesday and Thursday, and we will drop another podcast on Thursday afternoon just to bring you up to date on what we saw and what was said at Hallis Hall. So anything else, Dan, we forgot before we get out of here? No, I'm looking forward to getting back out there, getting some fresh eyes on some things that are happening out there. And we'll hear from some more people. Ellen Williams will speak this week. Richard Hightower will speak this week. And then we'll get a surprise curtain lift on what players are available. And I imagine that there'll be plenty of notable guys now with all the newcomers and the returners that we want to talk to. Uh, there'll be plenty to, to unpack the next time we get together. Fantastic. So this is in all caps. Download, listen, <laughs> and subscribe to the Take the North podcast wherever you get your podcasts or on your free Odyssey app. For Adam Sudzinski, our producer, for Dan Wiederer, who's covering the Bears for the Chicago Tribune. I am David Hoff on the Mullion Haw Show on 670 The Score. We will talk to you next time on the Take the North podcast. As soon as Studs gets this produced, I will put out a bossy all-caps tweet making people listen to this, and we'll be ready to go. Can't wait. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>